I'm Vanessa Cirillo, and this is Valley Voices Radio from New England Public Media. I've got three new stories for you today, originally recorded as part of the Story Slam series we produce with the Academy of Music. Our theme is Truth or Dare, and I figured to get us started today, we do a little game of our own. Let me introduce you to our producer, Katie Wright. Katie, want to play Truth or Dare? Well, you know I do. (laughs) Want me to start? Vanessa, Truth or Dare? Let's go with truth. All right. Let's see. Tell me, truthfully, what is the most embarrassing concert you've ever been to? I got to say, New Kids on the Block, summer of 1990, Lake Compounds. And I threw up my fried clam strips on the way home. (laughs) (laughs) It was really, really bad, and it sticks with me forever. I'm sure it does. (laughs) Thanks for asking, though. (laughs) That's the point of the game. All right. Now it's your turn. Uh Truth or dare, All right. Got to do a dare. All right. Well, lucky for you, Uh (laughs) my husband's growing some real hot, hot peppers (gasps) this season, and I got one for you right here. It is a habanero, fresh off the vine. Oh, my gosh. Dare you to take a bite, Katie. All right. Here goes. Oh, she's doing it. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, our first story is from Nikki Hamer, also known as Jane Bond by her family, because she tends to find herself in daring situations like this one. When you're on vacation with your family in the south of France, there are a lot of things you hope you never have to do. And one of the things you hope you never have to do is you hope that you never have to grab another woman's bag and throw it off the train. (laughs) I had to do that. I had just finished putting away all of our luggage into the bins on the train. And I came and I sat back down and I happened to look around and everybody had finished putting up their bags, and it was nice and calm, and there were music and French playing. So I happened to look around, and I, I looked right at the entrance of the train. And at the entrance of the train was this lovely bag, but it was unattended. Nobody was claiming the bag. Now, usually that wouldn't be a problem, but I had been in Israel um, a week before, <laughs> And if you leave your bag out anywhere in Israel, it's kind of like a sign of the apocalypse. You know that something is going to, or you hope that something will never explode or, or, or whatever. So I started to panic a little bit. I was like, is this yours? Is this, no, it's not yours. And it, and it was no one. So I did what any good American would do in a foreign country of our NATO allies. I stood up. I looked at my wife, who was Israeli, who was already going like this because she knew something was going to happen, and my daughter, who was just happy to be there, and I thought, it's now or never. I have to save the world. I have to save France, and I have to save my, my daughter and my wife. So I stood up, and in my best high school French, I looked at all the passengers, and I said, Excuse moi, <laughs> moi, yours, bag, luggage, yours, yours, luggage, transportation for clothes, yours. And they all kind of looked at me, you know how people look at you when you said something, well, something like that. And I heard two French women say something that kind of sounded like, I'm not sure, American. Idiot. (laughs) And then I saw a group of students sitting out to the side, and the students were looking out the window, and then they looked back at me, and then they looked outside the window as if something was really interesting happening out there, and they didn't want to pay attention to the American woman. So I said, okay. So I looked around, bag, bag, baggage, luggage, luggage. And then I looked at this one woman who was sitting near the bags, and she had dark hair. And she had really dark glasses on. And she had her earbuds on. She was listening to something. And I said, bag, luggage. 
And she just looked at me. And then she looked down. So I was starting to panic a little bit more because I was like, there's luggage. I had been in Israel. Something could explode, oh my God. And I had to do what you know, black women the world around have to do, especially during election season. I had to save the world. <laughs> so I took my little, my little mustard colored espadrilles and I walked down the stairs and I picked that bag up, <laughs> that heavy bag. At least I thought it was heavy. It wasn't really that heavy. It was really light. So I picked it up, and it had that kind of fake titanium gray silver with a lot of smudges going on, and it had itty-bitty tiny wheels, and it had a wheel, like you know that wheel that you get at the grocery store on that cart that just, just doesn't want to move quite right? So I put it back down, and I lifted it up, and with all my might, I pushed that luggage out the train onto the platform. And I went back up, I sat by my family. I, was, I felt blessed, <laughs> blessed really. And so my wife looked at me and she said, oh my God, what have you done? So she got up and she went and she got the bag and she brought it back on the train. <laughs> so as we rolled into Nice, I let everybody get out of the train because I wanted to see who that bag belonged to. So everybody was out except me, and one woman, that woman with the dark black hair and the dark glasses and the earbuds, and she took those earbuds out and she looked at me and she said, that bag is mine. <laughs> and she took the bag and she went really, really quickly off the train and then she started running on the platform and I ran after her with my mustard colored espadrille. <laughs> and I ran so fast and I took my camera and I was like, I'm gonna get a picture of her. And just then, a gust of wind blew and her jacket came up and on her back with this huge tattoo and it was a dragon it was green it was red and I realized I was after the woman with the dragon tattoo <laughs> Nikki I want you on my train girl Nicole Hamer is a writer and photographer, and her latest project is a book about traveling abroad while black. This is Valley Voices Radio from New England Public Media. I'm Vanessa Cirillo, and we're playing Truth or Dare today. Join our Facebook group to share your truth, or if you're feeling bold, accept my dare. I posted a challenge just for you on our Valley Storytelling Community Facebook page. Next, Deirdre Cuffey Gray gets real about her experience as a black woman living in Western Massachusetts. So I'm thinking about buying a gun. Even though I'm a former US history teacher, I never thought I'd be exercising my Second Amendment rights. But the truth of the matter is, I'm afraid of white people. Now don't get me wrong, some of my best friends are white. My wife is white, but it's angry white people that I'm afraid of, the kind with AK-47s. Recently, one of my nephews, Ellison, was in for auntie camp, and our, as we drove out of town, he asked me, Auntie Deidre, how come there's so many Black Lives Matter signs here and no black people? And I was stumped. All I could say is there are a lot of good white people here. Sometimes, uh, when you walk around, if you take a walk around my block, there are about 15 times more Black Lives Matter signs than there are black people. And it's me, I'm the black people. And, and that's okay. If you think about where I live, I live in a little spot that we call the compounds, lovingly. We decided not to call it the compound because compound sounds a little militant. It's four lesbian couples, three houses, eight cats, I did say lesbians, two dogs, a hamster, and three kids. And the fences in between our yards, they're gates so we can get to each other. It's a wonderful community. We love each other, and we'll love each other forever. But recently, a couple of signs disappeared at night, and that didn't feel so great. On any given Sunday afternoon, if you go across the Coolidge Bridge, 
there's scores of white people waving their flags, Trump flags, Confederate flags, and sometimes it feels like my little black life doesn't matter at all to them. The compounds formed a book group. We're looking at Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower. And it's a dystopian novel. It features a young girl, a go bag, a gun, and the end of the world as we know it. It is not an uplifting Sunday afternoon storytelling moment. But Tara, in her upset, called me one day and said, Deidre, you want to come to a firearm safety training course with me? And I said, yes. I don't know much about guns. There's a Christmas picture of a three-year-old me with my cousin Steven brandishing silver holsters and guns. And he looks delighted, and I look bewildered. He taught me that guns don't say pow, pow, pow. They say pew, pew, pew. I didn't really watch a lot of TV, had no idea who lo the Long Ranger and Tonto were. And I packed my lunch and my mask and headed to Franklin County Sportsman Club. It wasn't until I turned down the gravel road that I realized I was headed to the thing that, I, that scared me the most, white people and guns. And as the trees got thicker and the road got darker, the guns got louder. Pew, pew, pew. I couldn't turn around. Tara was in the parking lot waiting for me, and I'd paid my $100. So in we went. We ended up in a wall, wood paneled room. Our instructor was a former Marine, a shadow of himself, but all the simplify attitude left to, for days. He asked us to stand up and say why we were there. One guy stood up and said, to protect my property. Another person said, well, I'm here to go hunting with my dad. Tara stood up and said, to get my rifle from my, the homestead of my grandmother. And someone else said, I'm here to protect my Second Amendment rights. I decided not to say anything. It was best that I didn't. And through the course of the, the co course of the course, I began to think about Philando Castile, who probably learned the same thing that I did hands on the steering wheel, listen to the police officer, and he's dead. Brianna Taylor's boyfriend had a license to carry, and she's dead. And I began to think, maybe this Second Amendment thing doesn't really apply to black people. And as I left with my NRA handbook, I was resolved not to get a gun. And as I drove to the highway, there was a mob of white people at a Trump rally on every corner waving their women for Trump flags, electricians for Trump flags, their Confederate flags, turned on my signal, headed home, and reconsidered. I'm still thinking about buying a gun. Thanks. That's Deirdre Cuffey Gray, sharing her story on stage at a Valley Voices Story Slam in Northampton. She recently told me she's still terrified of guns and people in pickup trucks with guns, but for now, she's only packing bear spray and mace. For our last story today, Sue Schmidt dares to try out a brand new Olympic sport and learns the truth about her beloved coach, Janice. She was actually my grandparents' housekeeper. Her name was Mary, but she preferred to be called Janice. And we were cool with that because in truth, she looked exactly like Janice Joplin. She had strawberry frizzy blonde hair and she wore these kind of colorful hippie clothes. And she would sit on the back deck of my grandparents' house and smoke cigarettes and rock in the rocking chair while my grandmother cleaned the house. So I would paddle off to kindergarten in the morning and I would learn to sit on my little carpet square and raise my hand and be a good citizen. And then in the afternoons, I'd hang out with Janis Joplin. <laughs> Janis taught me everything I needed to know about being a six-year-old in the 60s. She taught me that you could get um, ginger ale to come out your nose. She taught me that you could walk a cat on a string like you walk a dog on a leash if you were willing to just kind of tug at it a little bit. She also taught me that one perfectly executed artificial fart under the arm could take the place of a thousand words. 
And so when winter came and it got too cold to take the cat for a tug, we settled in to watch the Olympics. And we all crunched into my grandparents' living room and she would just sit with me on her lap. And as we watched the bobsled, she'd tip me from side to side and forward and back. It was one of the best memories of my life. And when it was over, we were kind of disappointed. And so Janice decided that we would have our own Olympic games right there in my grandparents' foyer. And so my cousins and I and my brother had been down the banister many times, but always kind of backwards but first. And Janice decided if we put a pillow around our waist, we could go down head first and increase our velocity. She also decided that if we took one of those industrial laundry baskets and put it at the bottom of the banister, we could hit that and then bobsled across the hallway, thus inventing what my family now refers to as the luge bob. My brother was the first stop, and like everything my brother did, he was wildly out of control. So he came down the first kind of mogul section, hit the 180 degree hairpin turn, careened off, smashed his head on the plaster wall, and then sat for the rest of the games feeling the agony of defeat. <laughs> my cousin was next. He made a very clean run, hit the laundry basket, skid across the hallway, and smashed into the front door. And then it was my turn. I was terrified. And Janice walked me to the top of the banister and she strapped the pillow on and she said, my money's on you, kid. And I tucked in and I dipped my head and I came through those moguls and I came around the 180 degree turn, gripping on. I hit the giant slalom. I landed squarely in that basket. I skid across the front hallway. She opened the door, out the front door, onto the lawn, crashing into the frozen bird bath, tipping over. And I jumped out of that basket and I stuck the landing. An hour later, I received the gold medal, which was a chocolate coin on the end of a repurposed cat leash. <laughs> Winter turned to spring, and I came home one afternoon, and my grandmother met me at the door, and she said, I want to just let you know that Janice is leaving. And I said, what do you mean she's leaving? And she said, well, she's going to go live with her family. And I was like, but we're her family. And I just burst into tears. And I couldn't really understand, but I could tell from the look on my grandmother's face it was complicated. And I just cried myself to sleep that night because Janice was my best friend. She was my only friend at that point. And sure enough, the next morning, Janice and I stood at the bottom of that luge bob run. And I just cried. And she held me. And then she put her hand under her shirt, laid off the most perfect artificial fart you could ever hear. She put the floppy leather hat on her head, picked up her bag and headed out to the car. And I could hear as my grandfather and her drove away, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? We had a Volkswagen, but reality and fact did not really matter to Janice because in truth, Janice wasn't an Olympic coach. Janice wasn't a housekeeper. Janice was a psychiatric patient that lived at the state hospital where my grandparents worked. And when they had met her, they realized that she was not going to get better at the state hospital. And so she came to live with us so she could understand what it meant and remember what it meant to love and be loved. I never saw Janice again. I have no idea what became of her. But I know that in large part because of her, I became a musician and a mental health counselor and the youngest person to ever win a gold medal in the luge bob. Thank you. That was Sue Schmidt, who's not only an Olympic chocolate coin gold medalist, but a professor of clinical mental health counseling, the drummer for the band The Brevity Thing, and the mother of two amazing sons. She's never given up hope that Mary, or Janice, will turn on her radio, hear this story, and know the impact she had on her. That's our show for you today. I think we stuck the landing. Thanks for hanging out. Join me next week for stories about that strange place where looking for love and the interwebs meet. In an episode we're calling Love Me Tinder. Valley Voices Story Slam is produced by New England Public Media and the Academy of Music. This show is produced by our resident daredevil, Katie Wright. How you doing over there, Katie? Um, still, still trying to get over that habanero. <clears throat> Our theme is Love Disease by East Hampton's own Buddy McGurn's band. Find out more about Valley Voices and listen to episodes you may have missed at nepm.org slash valleyvoices. I'm Vanessa Cirillo. Join me right here next Saturday for more local stories on Valley Voices Radio.